Good afternoon, this is the Isle of Faces podcast. You are listening to me, Sir Buckley, from fairly cloudy England. The night came and we survived just about the biggest, most savage battle in Game of Thrones history. Well, it certainly took a bite out of this house uh, and we're going to talk about it today. So lucky you. This is episode 7, 8, what are we on? Who knows? I think it's 7. Uh, of the Isle of Faces, there's another mini cast of half an hour for you to try and slip in because there's so much to analyse in all these episodes. I know most of our Steam colleagues are going hour, two hours, three hours long, uh, and so they should because they've got a lot of cool stuff to say. We don't have as much cool stuff to say, we're not as smart, so we get it all done in a nice quick half an hour for you to listen to on the go. So, today, I'll be honest. It was a bit tempting to start this podcast off with a bit of a rant at the state of our fandom this week. Um, had some darker hours, I would say. Personally, I did not enjoy myself for a little bit of this week. But we're not going to feed that. We're not. We're going to put more fuel on the fire. We're going to stay positive. It's the Isle of Faces. It's, it's for everyone. It's a podcast for the fandom. That fandom does include people of both opinions. Well, it shouldn't include it as people we want to be disrespectful and take anything toxic. But like we say, we're not going to focus on that today. Whether you like to dislike The Long Night, you're still here, you can come and join us. And I do want to say a special thank you to all those members of the fandom, whether you're a content creator or viewer, whatever you are, those of you that have presented both sides of the argument, because there are two sides to the argument, there's some very valid points on both sides, in a respectful way, and a way that props up, not takes away from our fandom. Let's all just be glad we're getting season 8. Anyway, enough of that. Back to the good stuff. Before we kick off with what we've got today, I have an extremely fun duty. And that is announcing the next guests on the proper full episode of Isle of Faces that will be coming soon. And I can tell you, they are the wonderful hosts of Girls Gone Can. Celebrate with me, please. I will be welcoming both Chloe, or at Lies and Arbor, as you might know her, and Eliana, also known as Glass Table Girl, or sometimes Arrhythmic on Twitter. I can't tell you how, <laughs> uh, like, I can't tell you how excited I am for the girls to come on. Uh, I've been a major fan of both of theirs, both of their individual projects, Girls Gone Canon, Maester Monthly, Drunk Ice and Fire, all of it. They are some of the top creators, most creative, uh, most intelligent people we've got giving us all this good stuff. And even on a personal note, Chloe especially, really helped me get into all of this. You wouldn't have to put up with me uh, talking into this mic and making podcasts all the time. So if you do have complaints, send them her way. Really, really looking forward to getting this episode out there. So that will be sometime in the next week, maybe two. And uh, you can listen to how the girls found the fandom, got interested, all the usual stuff that we do. The return of Podrick's people, which I know you've all been waiting for. Let's get on with it. Today, myself and of course Lady Buckley is here to help me go through the nine, count them nine, major moments of the long night. We were going to separate them into categories, we split up the duties. That's how marriage works, folks. Write that down. We've got our three most savage, horrifying moments. Not only the dead guys, there's a lot to pick from. We've got our three most beautiful moments. It's season eight, come on, we know the theme by now. Beautiful moments. And, of course, our three most heartbreaking moments. Game of Thrones guys, don't let them trick you. So we're going to go through all those and to help me do that here, of course, not arguing with me about Sansa and Danny this week is Lady Buckley. Okay, so last week when you'd watched Endgame, or we'd watched Endgame, uh, I said your hand was probably probably hurting from me squeezing it so tight. So it's probably been shattered after watching The Long Night because I don't think I let go the whole time. Do you want to tell us your memories of watching it last Sunday? Um, I think the biggest ones were kind of seeing your emotions, the, you could just were so overwhelmed with everything, every time there was an ad break, it was very difficult to contain you. Mm. Um, no, but I think from the last three weeks, and it's going to be for the next three weeks, um, it's not so much my hand being shattered, it's more my sleep schedule. I really am struggling, because you can't not stay up and watch it. No, it's illegal. <laughs> Go watch it. I think that it was... An incredible episode. I think I, I'm going to go against what seems to be a lot of people saying how it's bad, but I personally think it was brilliant and that it doesn't matter what everyone's opinions, what they want to happen. It's the show. This is 
something that people have put together for entertainment purposes and no one can say that it wasn't entertaining. If you wanted something that you wanted to happen, you're watching the wrong show. Yeah, let me just say that. Okay, so we're not, we don't really need to give much of an update on our minor characters because nothing really happened. Bron isn't there. The Sunday and Gilly were both in the crypts and they've both survived. Yeah, then obviously Gendry and Pod, they were on the front lines, but we clearly see them at the end. Yeah, they survived. They were mm. on the walls as well. I'm not sure how yeah, maybe they all survived. Have, but I think maybe some more people should have died in the crypts. But there we are, all five of our minor characters alive, so we don't really need to talk about them. So instead we've got these nine, or nine and a bit <laughs> shots that we've come up with, uh, particular memories that are standing out to us. Might be able to remind you all uh, uh, five days after the fact. So we've got uh, our most savage moments, our most beautiful moments or shots, and the most heartbreaking ones. And you're going to kick us off with your three savage moments, and I'll chime in as we go. So what's your first one? Well, not my first one. Like When I talk about savage moments, I'm not talking about like the most deadly. I'm thinking about what these three that I thought of were the ones that kind of gave you the most fear mm. or hit you the hardest yeah the fear for the characters mm. and for what's going to happen and i think the first one was obviously there was a lot of things going on and there's so much within this episode that you could pull in but i think the kind of relief that everyone felt when the trenches were lit the first kind of bit that really hit home to me mm. was where the whites started throwing themselves in the flames mm. It was just the the momentary relief that they'd had when they already lost so many people from that first onslaught. How they knew that like Daenerys and John weren't paying like were, were paying attention but weren't available. Available. Yeah. So that fear of them, well, they're not just going to wait. They are. They don't. There's no care for lives of them. Whereas their side it is a care for life. They yeah. didn't have. They have complete disregard. So it's about that kind of relentless aim to cause death yeah it was, it was a pretty creepy look couldn't it because they just got staring across anyway pretty creepy i guess it's like they're almost in the eye of the storm because they've had this ferocious unending wave come at them then they get a break which you'd think would be nice but it might, might actually be even worse because now you get to look at all the dead people and realize exactly what they are and it's the fear that was across all their faces and that as soon as you saw the first couple go, there was obviously bits further down the line and there was that shot where it's just a wave then coming back again. It yeah. was held off briefly. And you could see in the background that obviously Daenerys was kind of burning some of them. But no matter, if you think about, she destroyed a Lannister army with just drove on. Mm. There's two of them flying around doing the same thing. And yet there was it it's was barely really damaged. Mm. I think it's also, like you say, they're realising not just that like what these things will do and that they've got they don't have to worry about death but also that their plans if you want to call them that are failing pretty quickly because like the bridge didn't work the trench didn't work now they're at the walls and they're getting a bit worried Mm. there's lots of like talk i know about like tactics and what should have been done but you don't really that's tactics with living people you said this yourself these were such the whole moment where they just start throwing themselves at the fire just proves that this is not something that any army Mm. would do it's not something that would ever be expected it's something that it's unique to that army and makes it terrifying in its own sense yes very obviously now they've got no idea what they're fighting now because it's nothing not going to find much else willing to throw itself into fire what about your second moment um still going with fire because obviously that was a big key part but I think there was almost a sense of relief when you thought that the Night King was being engulfed in Dragon Flame and how Dragon Flame seems to damage the Whites, and you had that sense that oh maybe it will kill him, but actually it wasn't actually that moment. It was the moment after where he smiled, mm. and it's just that well, what's next? Is Drogon gonna die? Is it like he's just got this ultimate power that everyone? I don't know whether anyone else thought this, but I thought that Dragonfire would kill him. Well, it certainly makes sense considering they're vulnerable to obsidian and valerian steel, which are mm. like dragon based. But the the just the I wanna say innocence, but it wasn't innocence, it's more the mockery of the smile. Yeah. That just the evilness just kind of 
rings true. true. It's the same way that Cersei smiled when the Scepter Baelor mm, fell. Yeah, that similar. It was that smile. It was small. It wasn't. It wasn't elaborate. It didn't have to cheer or anything else. It was just it one little like emotion. A, a, like a bigger brother holding off the little one, and like they're not. Like it's not even a problem. Your dragon flame. I'm not sure which bit was creepier, really. The fact that he's not being damaged by like their ultimate weapon, or that he's plenty creepy anyway. He's you now like a thousand times creepier when he's smiling at you. You know, you're really in trouble. I think we'd rather have him scowling. Yeah, but I think it's more than just being creepy. It was the it's the kind of powerful enemy that you see within stories, that you see within movies, that is completely unsmiling, that has never said a word, mm. that is just that kind of presence. And for his complete character to show that kind of strength in that, well, what else you can do? You've seen what my army's doing to yours. I don't need to do anything but the smallest smile and just fear just obliterates it all. You could see that on Daenerys' face. And that is kind of the point of the episode where it really does look like they're really in trouble now because like that, that was a wild card that, okay, if it, as soon as he comes out, we can burn him. And then that hasn't worked, so now what we're going to do? And now that all the plans really have gone. What about your third and you know, your final savage moment? Well, I would say the the kind of third one that I would say that kind of encompasses the most kind of fear value and within it would be that we could talk about the moment with Arya at the end and say the fear that she was going to be killed, but then that can encompass so many different emotions within that one moment and mm. it's such a quick moment considering yeah. the build of everything but actually what I think had more fear was when John was wa- well, he wasn't walking obviously but it was running through the courtyard and he doesn't have time to stop and help his friends they're being absolutely swarmed the music's really eerie at that point mm. you see just the strongest fighters kind of absolutely engulfed by people I only see like Tormund and Grey Worm and Brienne just absolutely backed up with all these whites around them and you just feel like it's going to be the end. It's that music that was brilliant that just really... Liking. Yeah, it really captivated kind of the fear of the moment. It wasn't built up, it was really quite calming and chilling as it were. Mm. Yeah, it was a very wonderfully uh, shot moment as well like following him through and it's one of those longer shots that they're so famous for. But like you say, uh, he's going past Sam, who's now down on the floor, just hacking away at whatever he can see. And like you said, the guys on the walls, like they're ba- they're basically pushing people away. They're not even using swords anymore. There's so many of them. And you really do think, well, that's that's it. And it's obviously this incredibly hard moment for John. It's one of the better John moments, I think, where he's seeing this and he still chooses duty over all of that and he tries to get to Bran instead of... And it must be ridiculously hard choice. Well, I think that's... I would have been disappointed if he had tried to help someone. It was not even duty or anything. He had a role to play. His role was more important than kind of defending his friends. It's it's the sacrifice of that. Uh, I think the moment was more that that was kind of the turning point right before the end where you thought, well, actually, no, this could all go. We could lose all these yeah, characters. I definitely feel that way, especially because during that uh, little run through as well, like the castle is crumbling. They're just like pouring through holes in the floor at this point, and then Viserion's there doing even more damage, and it all does really like it's going to hell. So that's a great moment. Just out of interest, how many times have you listened to the Night King this week? Every time I've gone in the car. And the kitchen. Uh, the the dog now uses it as a um, lullaby. Did you enjoy my dancing to it earlier? Yes, it was brilliant. All right, thank you. Uh, I think the only... I agree with all your three moments there. The only one I'd add... The one for me, still the worst moment of all of them, I think, the uh, most, like, heart-thumping, is when... The Dothraki one was good, where the flames go out, but after that, when the wave actually hits the front lines, because you can hear them coming, you can kind of see the shadow moving across from that aerial shot, and you expect them just to be running and charging, but they're actually, like, swarming. It looks literally like a wave. They're almost riding each other. And they hit so hard and so viciously, they just, like, smash through the first three rows. And it's such a... Like, this is not like anything else that they could have ever dreamt of. It's so 
overwhelming vicious and overwhelming and it's just like we're, they're in trouble yeah um i get that i just didn't feel like that was kind of my oh, top yeah. three as it were i'm just saying that with that one it is it is very terrifying it is that has got those moments but it's something that as it's an army and it's an army of the dead it was kind of more expected as it were than the other moments that i chose that's fair uh, that would be the one I remember. That uh, made my heart stop to stay when they just smash in. All right, so I've picked the more beautiful uh, moments or particular shots normally for this one. So the first one, which we spoke about a little bit already, is the lighting of the trench. So Melisandre has already come along and lit all the Dothraki on fire before they go and die. But later on, she comes back out with Grey Worm. When uh, Daenerys and Jon aren't there, the plan's going wrong, and they need the trenches lit. And she comes out, and she has this one last little crisis of faith, as we've seen from her before, where it's not lighting, and they're getting closer, and people are going down. And then, whoosh, up it goes, and it's the final confirmation that her god does exist, and she does have power, even though we've just seen the trick of the Dothraki, but I think this was better. And it's that moment, that one shot, it's been posted a lot on the internet for good reason of the flames reflected in her eyes we've seen that kind of thing before but her realising that everything she's worked for and everything she's been saying is dead on she was supposed to be here to light this and even though it's like you said it doesn't work overall but it does buy them that few minutes of rest and she did need to do it or they were in big trouble and that was my first one yeah you know that's not one of my personal favourites yeah but these are my free choices I know but what I think with that one what was really good is you could even link that a little bit with kind of something that has got fear inducing within it in that with that shot where she has got the flames in her eyes you literally see the white go up hmm. in front of her hmm. and the fear she has not only for kind of her faith and her religion and stuff, but also about death in that she's already said that she was going to die that day and you didn't know whether it would be that moment. Mm. And it was that strength within that moment. Okay, so my second one isn't actually even in the castle. It's above it. It's, uh, again, talked about a lot on the internet. I think I tweeted about it as well. When Rhaegal and Drogon and Daenerys and John go up and up and up to escape this horrible vortex snowstorm thingy. And they actually break the, break the cloud line. And there's this like moment of tranquility where it's the clouds below, like a sea of clouds they're like roiling and moving and stuff, and the stars above, and it's just this complete opposite to all this savage ferociousness down below compared to like a completely different world and there's a really beautiful shot of the two dragons just on this sea of clouds, and it's just brilliant it's very haunting. picture. And also haunting, yeah, because you do know what's going on still. Yeah, and the eerie silence of it when thinking the kind of nature of what it is. It's two, it's two dragons fighting another dragon. It's the fight of life and death, and it's Well, it's silent. just before that, isn't it? It's just before the fight. Yeah, but as in he's he symbolises, the Night King symbolises his death, and he's the one fighting them, and they're waiting for him, well, as it were, they're looking for him. Mm. It's the silence, it's the hauntingness of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an almost it's beautiful yet creepy or like eerie. Let me say. And then my last one is, is not a shot; it's more of a, just a moment. Um, and it's after the dead have broken through the walls; they've come across the flames, like you said. Um, and I has had a good go at them and turn them back, but they're still coming, coming, coming. Just while you're there, I just loved the moment where Arya is having those fights, and Davos is just watching. Her. Davos is watching, taking, <laughs> just a, taking a picture for. Twitter. He did say he was terrible at fighting. Yeah, but he survived. And um, anyway, so all that's happened, and uh, down below in the yard, Sandal Gagain's had enough and is having another moment, possibly because of the fire everywhere, possibly because of the oncoming hord- hordes of death. I'm not sure, but either way, Beric's trying to um, coerce, pers- him. coerce him, persuade him to get back involved. He's not having it in his usual Sandal way until Beric points to. Aya, and then there's no question. Sandal sees it, you actually see concern on his face, and he's just off. And considering everything they've been through, and we've spoken about their connection the last few weeks, it's a wonderful moment to see him not care about fire, not care about death. He's just going after Aya, and obviously 
she needed it. Well, yeah, like it's been said to him several times, he had a purpose, there was a reason why he was there. And the reason why Beric was brought back so many times was to lead Arya through, to help protect her, as it were. And he's provided that role several times to her, being her protector. Um, he almost gave his life for her. He clearly cared for her and her character and it is quite fitting that he would play that role towards her seeing as she he's not a knight he's not he doesn't want to be a knight he doesn't want to be he's seen as quite rough around the edges he's but he's strong he's got a strength behind him which is what we saw with Arya. so mm. he sees that within her and sees that protective side yeah it's just the the instant click there's no thinking even though he's been told about this purpose and obviously knows what they're up against and they need to win he stopped caring, doesn't care about what he saw in the flames or what Beric says or any, or f- literally fighting for the living. It's only Aya, seeing Aya, that kicks him into gear and off he goes. And that's the best way to say it or how he feels for her. Well, it's also like seeing her fear, though, isn't it? It's not just seeing her fighting the battle, it's seeing her fear, seeing her struggle when she's always been the strong one she's always been fighting yeah but she hadn't shown any fear by that point because yeah she was hanging off the roof well and that one actually links in with your extra beautiful shot didn't it it's quite similar yeah like i would have chosen well my favorite bit would was the moment where there's the connections between past episodes where melisandre's with Arya. so obviously the hound has stepped up and defended her and so has beric and yet at that moment, Melisandre's explaining to her, well, what do we say to the god of death? Yeah. And the kind of the link back to season one, the link of season one when she, it's Syria Pharrell. Yeah. The link back to season one, the link back to when they first met and they had that conversation. This, the kind of circle I thought that was beautiful and it was such a under stated moment yeah that's what i was thinking understated because mm-hmm. it's not you know obviously looking back we now realize how important it is but when you actually watch it before you realize what i was going off to do it doesn't actually even though it's a cool cool back you don't realize how big of a moment that is it is but i think it's also it's breathtaking that little bit to think about how much the link has gone if you think about the the moment with hodor mm. you think about how far ahead yeah, these connections true. have been made and it's so ingrained within the story that this was going to happen and it's something that despite whoever you are you don't think that there's mm. these connect. you think of all these different possibilities and they always come up with a new one I think that's the point of it all isn't it that like Melisandre and Beric were right everyone does have a role I think that's why there's not much call for getting upset about who killed or didn't kill the Night King because like, it's a team effort anyway. But you, they've all interacted so much that you can literally pick anyone out of these survivors and be like, well, if they weren't there, then so-and-so doesn't get there and they don't save them. So then that person's not there and this doesn't happen. It's too much of an interlinked web. It's not as simple as boy grows up, boy kills, evil person. They're I, all there. I think it's quite interesting that's actually sparked all of this when... Arya's had the same conversation about Joffrey with Sansa when she asked San- said Sansa well it said that you killed Joffrey I wish I had right the end of last season yeah yeah I thought it was just interesting to say that she like so many people wanted to kill him I just thought it was interesting oh uh, yeah I guess it would have yeah. that mirror that link that actually all these people all these people are wanted to kill him and everyone wants him to be killed by this person or that person and either way you have the same result. It's another character that's so kind of hated and demonised that the end goal, people want different people to do it, but actually there's the fact that there is one character with that strength from a team, mm. I think that's yeah, just that's kind good, of... Good point. Yeah, I just think it kind of brings it all together. Definitely a lot of Melisandre in this episode, thankfully. <laughs> I know, I know how much you love Melisandre. I do. From, from the start, but... No, I... I think that, yeah, that moment with her is very understated and it's just something that I thought was should have had a lot more claim. I think it's still a lot easier now that you look back, like I said. Anyway, let's move on. So we've got three left and these are our most heartbreaking 
pull on the heartstrings moment. Uh, we'll take these in turn. So, would you like to go first? Yeah. Um, so the first one is obviously in the crypts um, when the whites are within the crypts as well, and there's the, the you've got Tyrion and Sansa hiding behind the tomb, mm. and Sansa pulls out the dragon glass. I know you had a, a fear about that. I did. I genuinely thought that they were going to like euthanize each other. And that was their way out because I thought that all of them in the crypts were going to die because you would think self-contained space, no fighters in there, untold amounts of undead just cracking out the walls. So I thought they were just all goners. And yeah, I had a real moment where I thought she was going to stab Tyrion, Tyrion was going to stab her, whatever. And then their next episode, you'd find them <laughs> dead in the crypts next to each other, like holding hands or something. And I was like, yeah, that'd be a pretty heartbreaking moment. Well, I, that thing is that watching it even the first time and multiple times it never crossed my mind that that would happen so it's really interesting that you would because in my mind it wasn't that my mind was that she was she'd been building up through the episode saying how we're not fighters that's why we're here we can't mm. do anything we were at this point useless she was sent down there because she was rendered useless as a way that she was coming across yeah. and that actually that last moment she was going to fight and they share that what I think was most heartbreaking about it was the moment where kind of obviously he kisses her hand they've had this connection about saying well he was the best husband mm. that she'd had and i know it's not a thing to compare to but he did always do right by her and he did have care for her yeah well he was the best of them mm. depends on how much you value the best of a forced marriage but still but yeah that moment and you're dead on i think that's exactly what they were trying to say that even though they're they're the two biggest non-fighters, really, since Daenerys has dragons, and now a sword. Um, and she, like you say, she's been saying that, and then they think we're still going to fight and try and protect these people because they're the two leaders down there. Yeah, and I liked that moment. I know that you thought it was to do with like killing each other and having that way out, but the way that I thought about it when I was watching it was more that I need to act now. I need to act in this moment. Yeah, it was more about the moment rather than thinking these schemes, these plots, these plans, these things. It was the baser instincts. One of my most heartbreaking moments uh, where I... I, Multiple times I put my... I'm sure you saw my hand over my mouth and kind of went (laughs) like this. Um, But one of them was near the end when Daenerys comes and saves Jon and then the, the newly risen dead, or some of the old dead as well probably, all swarm on Drogon like, uh, like ants, like locusts, and Daenerys rolls off, and then you just see him literally getting covered head to toe. And I thought he was going down. Even when he flew off, I thought, oh, are we going to see him like thump out of the sky in a minute? Because what... And that reminded me a lot of Hodor as well. There's not many worse ways to go than just these like knives and bites. It'd be like us being eaten by maggots or something. And I just, just couldn't bear the thought of that being how Drogon goes out and Aziz on History of Westeros mentioned this it recalls what does happen in the Targaryen histories that's how they go out in the dragon pit and that flicked across my mind I was like, oh god <laughs> I think what was also fitting about that was that it could have been it could have been a fitting end in that it was actually when you saw who the dead were that were crawling on him and that were had just been almost awakened mm. it was the Dothraki and considering he is named for I didn't know a Carl and mm. it was the Dothraki and it mm. was where he's kind of what he stands for within Daenerys so obviously you've got her like brothers and stuff but he was the kind of Dothraki link and it was the Dothraki that yeah there were others amongst it I'm sure yeah. there were on Sully's and I stuff but that. the kind of the people that you see rise are a lot of them were Dothraki and it was very interesting that that was they were the ones that were swarming him and it was a good kind of um, microcosm for the episode and that he's like the biggest, most powerful thing, but being overwhelmed by sheer force of numbers is exactly the same as what's happening. We've got all these big characters, all wonderful fighters, but they're all just being overwhelmed by numbers. And yeah, just be, it would have been a horrible... Yeah. It, makes, it gives me goosebumps <laughs> to think about if they'd just hacked him apart. Yeah, yeah, I think you had a lot more shock in that. You, you really thought he was going to go. I just would have been sad. Yeah, and it is sad because when you think that Daenerys, the, these times that he's come to save her and he's been, like, the strength, like mm. you say, he's the big, he's the one, 
he's the strength behind it and he couldn't handle it he had to get himself away from that situation and try and save himself and also this is at the moment where like it's just about the same as this courtyard moment where everything looks like it's going wrong so you're thinking if they do lose Drogon as well they've really got zero chance especially since Rhaegar just dis- disappeared off screen and we thought maybe they're all going down yeah we weren't really sure what's mind. happening with no. any of those dragons at no. that point do you want to give our last heartbreak moment oh it's kind of the most obvious one really I think people would guess yeah. um, but it was not even heartbreaking it was absolute gut wrenching mm. to see Theon having had this complete kind of it was a really fitting ending for him it was a really good like arc for him in that he has come back home the him and Bran earlier on in the episode have said that he's like home he it all his actions led him to that point yeah to be defending to be there at Winterfell when you see one of the first things you see within Thion and it's not the first time you see him but one of the first ones is he's defending like Bran with an arrow and yeah. he's doing the same thing again and obviously the most heartbreaking isn't even the moment he dies it's the moment beforehand the words from Bran and the fact that he charges regardless of seeing so many whites all the white walkers the actual night king stood in front of him and he chooses that when actually what the season before he couldn't risk his life for Yara yeah, good but he would for Bran didn't think of that. and I think the simplicity of Bran saying you're a good man yeah and thanking that was, him that was the tearjerker because you know what like it's simple words but what that means to Theon and what he's been through and I always I keep whenever I think of Theon now I keep thinking back to his line just after Ramsay catches him when he kind of admits to himself that his real father died in King's Landing yeah I think I stuck with him because that makes Sansa his real sister and Bran his real brother and Winterfell his real home like Bran says and I didn't you can get into an argument about whether he can ever really repay what he did, but he's not going to get any closer than this. Mm. I know, there was a little bit of hope within me that obviously he'd been through so much that when he was stabbed, that there was a little bit of a glimmer of hope to me that, oh, actually, no, he's been through worse, he's going to pick it up and he's going to kill yeah, himself. Yeah, he's been But no, the, that wasn't even, the, the, his death wasn't a heartbreaking moment, it was the moment the before. The words. The words, yeah. and his the kind of steel that it brought within him and if that didn't bring people to tears or at least speechless or just have that gut-wrenching feeling within them then Mm. i don't know who these people are definitely not that is definitely one of the highlights of the episode that is a good comparison from him in season seven not being able to charge down euron but now he can well yeah he's a human person he's defending his sister by blood and who's someone who's sworn to defend, someone who's sworn to protect, and he couldn't do that, but he could fight someone who's kind of otherworldly, who's got a massive army in front of him, he's on his own. Like, and it's obvious that, like, it's, even if he did somehow kill him, it's still the end because there's all these... Yeah. Like, he doesn't know for sure what's going to happen. They're surrounded, so... Yeah, pretty heartbreaking moment. And an episode full of... Emotion and wonder. <laughs> well, there was there was another one that we were talking about, though, wasn't it? Was it? About heartbreaking, about all the deaths. Because we've talked about things, so that is the big one. But there was the little ones as well. I think they were, all the deaths were pretty emotional in their own way. Lyanna, mm-hmm. uh, Giant's Bane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Giant's Bane. Ed, saving Sam one last time. Jorah, obviously. <laughs> I just... Just with Ed, just I like the moment of him just telling Sam to get up. So how many times do they tell him to get up? When yeah, yeah that's a good wall. callback as well. And then obviously with Jora, it was that it was almost parallel to what we said last week with him taking on that barristan role. Yeah, we did kind of call that yeah, welcome. Yeah, he was completely surrounded and he had that fight to save someone the same way that Barristan did. It was emotional now. Yeah. We've talked about yeah. Should we watch it again? We've talked about film, but Melisandre's stuff as well. It's pretty hard hitting for me. I I won't go on because I already wrote this in an essay. But uh, like as soon as it's done, there's no waiting. Her duty's just done, and then out she goes into the snow. She's got no interest in celebrating or 
saying like, oh look, I was right all those years or anything like that. It just goes off and it's released from a duty. Yeah, I think that hit you a lot harder than it hit me. I That's think. I, like me I know. I think with me, I, I didn't really understand so much the kind of logic behind it. I thought with she has done is that it would have been a lot more. There's a lot more peaceful ways. I thought she, the way that she did it, walking off into the snow, yeah. is I don't know. It just it didn't, no, I, I didn't that. quite understand it at the I time. Like that. I know, you, I know, you, I know you like the, you like the symbolism of walking out into the snow up, yeah. rather than the fire and yeah. these things, but well, we've gone a whole uh, episode about arguing, and I think other people have been doing that for us enough this week, so we'll leave it there before we join them. <laughs> so that's our nine and a bit major moments or major memories from the long night episode three. Um, we'll be back at the weekend. We'll do some wonders on Sunday. What we're wondering, uh, we'll do some other stuff as well and give our final thoughts before episode four, before our nap time. You can go and ice your hand now, go and put the Night King on. Um, we'll probably watch it again later. <laughs> I'm just hoping that my uh, heart kind of slows down. There was no point in that episode where I ever thought, you can take a break now, no. you can breathe. I didn't blink, <laughs> even during the adverts. No, I'm not risking that. <laughs> right, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys, thanks for joining us for another mini-cast uh, all about the long night. We will come back with another episode on Sunday, although we are attending a beer festival tomorrow, so let's just hope we're not too hungover to do it. We might sound a bit different. We'll probably talk about what we expect coming up. We might talk about moments we didn't think worked. We have definitely have some things we're wondering. I don't know, we'll figure it out. We normally do. And, of course, that is all before we take our mid-afternoon nap for our 2 a.m. show of episode 4 can't wait still excited uh, please fill your time between now and then if you haven't already with all the other podcasts and articles that our fandom is offering you know the guys by now I don't need to repeat them but keep looking history of Westeros have a look at Brendan Beefish's arguments have a look at everyone else there's a lot of good stuff out there and just don't feel overwhelmed if you're feeling you love the episode and you're feel like you're getting swarmed by the dead of people who didn't keep standing strong doesn't matter as long as you enjoyed it if you're the other variety and you can't believe that no one agrees with you how bad it was there are plenty of people that do agree with you don't worry keep it cool guys well done we'll see you next time <laughs>